The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is supported in part by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, conserving the wild things and wild places of Texas thanks to members across the state. Additional funding is provided by Toyota. Your local Toyota dealers are proud to support outdoor recreation and conservation in Texas. Toyota, let's go places. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Oh, they put me in a baby crib going out there like we went today, never done nothing else. <laughs> You can come just within a, an hour's drive of Houston and experience Texas the way it used to be. You typically find the bats in abandoned houses in the spring to summer months because they're looking for a warm roost. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Well, we're making a shrimp drag now, but Bobby ain't catching none. Yep, yeah, Roger, Roger. Meet Anthony Stringo. I'm gonna go try the ship channel. This bay shrimper calls Port O'Connor home. I was born here, that's all I've ever done, you know. Matter go to Bay, mainly. While Gulf shrimpers may stay at sea for weeks, Bay shrimpers take things one day at a time. This right here is a new concept for me for the last 10 years. This is called a lazy line. So you don't have to pull the whole net in and get to the back of it. A lot has changed over the decades and Anthony has had to adapt. His catch now includes Atlantic croaker, a fish recreational anglers like to use for bait. You know, the people, the weekenders got to be here. The people that buy them has got to be here. You catch all you want, but if there's nobody to buy them, you're not going to make nothing. You want one about that size for fishing. That right there, put it back. Uh. While Anthony's been shrimping for most of his life, he's still decades behind his dad. 50 years, I'd say, you know. Probably one of the oldest left out here. Might be one or two more his age left. So one, two, one. And that's all I'm gonna do is reinforce the edges here. Add another string here to stay together. Jesse's string goes 75. And when he's not shrimping, he's mending his nets. Pilings, tires, there's just so many different things. The Stringos have been shrimping for generations. Here's Jesse's dad, Junior, in a Houston Chronicle from 1930. Oh yeah, he's the one that taught me. Yeah, it's done in the 50s. Oh, that was so damn much shrimp, we didn't know what to do in them days. Those days were indeed prosperous, says Mark Fisher who studied the shrimping industry for 25 years. Uh, shrimping in the 1950s, it was a very good decade. Uh, price of shrimp was, was very high. Fuel, fuel was cheap, labor was abundant. There was almost no government regulation back then. If you could work hard and, and uh, handle it, it was all for the taking. I mean, there was lots of shrimp. They kept doing it down after about 50 years. Working them. Yet Jesse is still out working them. Oh, uh, what happened? His old boat, the High Roller, rolls along. You know how it gets old and everything coming apart? Oh, I don't want to stick my hands in there. I have to guide the cables back and forth like you do a rod and reel. Jesse has a new partner, his brother James who just sold his shrimping license oh, back. and his boat. Yeah, I was getting too old to work by myself now, and I just had to give it up. Whew. I'm all right with it. I know I knew I couldn't do it no more, so I just went ahead and sold everything. Boat, license, and everything. Well, there are 300 or so licensed bay shrimpers now, 
Back in the late 80s, Gulf and Bay shrimpers were out in force with more than 5,000 licensed shrimpers on the water. With that much pressure, the state of Texas started to buy back shrimping licenses. The reason? Shrimp nets bring in much more than just shrimp. For every pound of shrimp that is caught, they also catch four pounds of other species. These species have no commercial value and they're just pitched over the side. It doesn't really sound that so bad, but when you're talking about 60, 80 million pounds of shrimp being caught every year, that's a lot of bycatch. We would buy back a commercial shrimp license and then retire it, which in turn would reduce the amount of bycatch that is being caught. Hang on. Now James has a little extra money in his pocket, and he and his brother Jesse can work together. You ready? Yeah. I'd go crazy if I had to sit home and do nothing. I had one brother retired at 62 and he didn't make it to 64. That's sorry. There weren't too many shrimp, a few croakers and a, and a few ribbon fish. There weren't too much of nothing. Nah, it wasn't too much. It's the unknown that's the constant concern in this business. You never know there, you know. Sometimes you have a good year and next year you might not get, you know, hardly nothing. Always different. It's not always the same, or you can depend on it all the time. Yeah, we picked the wrong place to go to. Get the hell out of here! This is it. We're going home. And I had a bad looking one day. They can only bet on a better day tomorrow, as shrimping still pulls them back to the bay. Well, as long as I'm able to work, I'm going to work. There's just no hurry no more. Tell you, just let it go one step at a time. <laughs> oh yeah, he, he still gets around good for his age and what he does. He, he's one of the last ones left. Yeah, he's gonna do it till he can't do it no more. Yeah. Anthony is out this morning too. Sunshine with a northeast wind. They're starting out by checking what's called a tri-net. Oh, we have the little net down, looking around just to find the best spot where we won't be dragging for nothing. You're trying to see what you can find. And you get an idea. We're at 15, Anthony. Best try so far. You dropping it in? Yeah. We'll get the jump chain on the side. Anthony grew up out here and has literally shrimped Matagorda Bay since he was a baby. They put me in a baby crib going out there like we went today. Never done nothing else. <laughs> Back then and even now, every day is a gamble. It's just a challenge because you don't know what you're going to catch. You love to get out there and make good money today, $1,000 a day, and the next two weeks catch nothing. Like I said, it's just a challenge. I love it. Looks like okay. shrimp in there. Yeah, it looks like shrimp in there. Yeah. Since these guys are catching shrimp for use as live bait, it's a race to get them back to the bait shop. More money this way, about 10 times as much money. It takes more effort to keep them alive. You gotta have pumps running, you gotta drag shorter drags. That was pretty good for, for live bait. That was, that was a pretty good drag. Aye! <laughs> Anthony's made it back to Port O'Connor, and it's time to unload today's catch. We're picking the croakers out, the golden one. Get the shrimp out now? Yeah, here, give me a scoop here and get rid of this one. A little bit more. We got live shrimp caught, we caught some bait, and we got, what, almost 40 quarts of shrimp. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit, pay for the field. The fresh from the sea table shrimp is where the money used to be made. These are the big shrimp. We ought to be getting four dollars a pound for them shrimp right there. But the market's not there because the market they, they get so much from overseas and the farm raised shrimp. Foreign farm raised shrimp operations have taken over. Aquacultured shrimp, they can be raised at a much lower price than you can catch them in the wild. 90% of the shrimp consumed in the U.S. are farm raised. It's cheaper to grow them than it is to catch them. So the price of shrimp has actually dropped. Uh, the dockside value of shrimp today 
is lower than it was in the 1980s. Kind of throws the wind out of your sails. Yeah, the price of shrimp fell. People went to go find something else to do, you know. The changes leave Anthony as the last in his family's business. You can't make no more with it. I mean, it's just... Uh, unless she has kids and they want to do it, but other than that, yeah. And yet, after a hard day of work, in these difficult times, there is still reason for a smile. <laughs> nothing broke, so we don't have to fix nothing to go back out tomorrow. So that's a plus. That's a real big plus. Despite the low prices, the pounding on the body, the last of the stringos carries on. It just, it's habit. I mean, I just something I've done all my life. Somebody ever said, you, you went to college? Yeah, I went to college. You might go to Bay. <laughs> this project was funded in part by a grant from the Sport Fish Restoration Program. The thing that makes Brazos Bend so special and so magical is the diversity here. You can come just within a, an hour's drive of Houston and experience Texas the way it used to be. And within this 5,000 acre park, we've got swamps to marshes to lakes, coastal tall grass prairie, and we've also got some pristine bottomland hardwood forests here. There's so many things to see here, but, but one of the biggest draws here are the alligators. On a good day, it's not uncommon to be able to walk the trails and see 30, 40 big alligators out basking on either the edge of the trails or out on the islands. And I'm happy to say that no one has ever been injured by an alligator here at Brazos Bend. We've got three big picnic areas. Probably half the people that come into the park visit Elm Lake and 40 Acre Lake because they want to see birds, they want to see alligators. It's a great place to come out and spend the day with the family and have their own twist of how to enjoy the park. <laughs> we have about 30 miles of hiking and biking trails. The majority of our trails are nice wide gravel trails, so they're, they're family friendly, whether you're on bikes with kids or even strollers. If you're into a little more challenging hiking or challenging biking, we've got some trails that are back along the Brazos River that offer a little more uh, scenery and probably a little more challenging for mountain biking, a little topography back there. We've got a fantastic nature center here where we have some exhibits and live animals that are local to this area. That looks like a snake. Every Saturday and Sunday we do free interpretive programs here at the nature center. Oh, you can see the gold now. So if you come to the park and you want to learn a little bit more about something specific, come take advantage of one of our interpretive programs. The George Observatory is located here in the park. It's actually owned and operated by the Museum of Natural Science in Houston, but it has a 36-inch research telescope in a dome and then two 18-inch telescopes in domes. Right now we've got it on Jupiter. You can come out any Saturday afternoon and evening and buy tickets to view through the big scopes, and there's always lots of Astronomer Club members that are willing to show you whatever they're looking at that night. Oh, yeah. Very cool. We have this diverse package right here at Brazos Bend State Park that's less than an hour's drive away from the biggest urban area in the southern United States, being Houston. We're kind of off the main beaten path here. We don't have motorboats and we don't have water skiing, we don't have miniature golf. People that come to Brazos Bend come here for the nature. We really are a nature lover's paradise here at Brazos Bend. It's another utopian day in Utopia, which is an actual place in the hill country west of San Antonio. Kind of a small community, a lot of ranching, a lot of hunting business, a lot of retired folks. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Every week, Lee Beverly serves a community of churchgoers. 
my main job as the pastor here at the Utopia Baptist Church, and that's my full-time occupation. But outside of worship, the Reverend Beverly provides another service in this community. My hobby is taxidermy. When his focus is not saving souls, it's saving skins as lasting mementos of hunting and fishing trips. It's not a calling, I don't think, but I think it's part of a gift that God has given me, an eye to see the nature of animals and, and try to take something that is lifeless and make it look lifelike, look real. I'll put a little glue on here. I know I'm not the best taxidermist in the world by a long shot, but I know I'm not the worst neither. <laughs> You know, every taxidermist is different. A look around the Beverly home shows just how much Lee has learned about the art of taxidermy. The first thing I ever mounted was a squirrel. And I used a paper towel roll and two black marbles for the eyes. Ended up about that long. <laughs> and so it's been a conversation piece. My sister still has it. I grew up, my dad was a hunter, and his dad was a hunter. Kind of a family thing. So we did it all of our life. Because I love nature, I love the outdoors. Well, let's not waste something that's been harvested, it's just preserving that beauty so that we get to see it all the time. Hide the horns, preserving the memories. Let's see where we're at. You know, I've been asked, you know, well, is that a godly thing or not to do? James 1.22. We're to be doers of the word. In Genesis chapter 2, God told man to take care of the earth. Harvesting an animal and knowing the numbers that we can harvest is part of conservation. I'm usually out here by myself, and yeah, it's a good quiet time. Sometimes I'll have to stop and write down some sermon thoughts. While the Reverend's hobby seems at peace with his faith, there is one kind of taxidermy he will not touch. I've had people ask me to do a cat and, and a poodle, and I said, no way, <laughs> no pets. This is a goose. These are wings for a turkey. Oh, that's my jackalope. Though the craft has evolved with creativity and available supplies. All kind of sizes. White-tailed deer. Fish eyes. Some things have not changed. Fixing to do a quail. It teaches you patience. Already skinned it out, put the eyes in it, and then I've got wires in the legs and that'll help make him stand up. That's one of the reasons why I picked up taxidermy as a kid, to learn patience. set them in here and have them standing up now. And then it's just a matter of getting all the feathers in the right place. Preserved with care, a mount like this quail can last a lifetime. As long as they don't have a cat in the house, it still has bird scent. <laughs> and it still looks like a bird. So I tell everyone now, if you got cats at home, beware. Although most work is for clients, the Beverly's keep their own mounted memories. Whenever someone goes hunting and they harvest their animal, got a bunch in here. That's an experience that they have for the rest of their life. Some of mine and the kids. Uh, this is my son's first deer. When they take that home, put Seven it on their wall, old. every time they walk by, they look at that. So all those memories come back. Every hunt with the dad or the sons or even my daughter, uh, she's a hunter too. They all have some kind of a special meaning behind every one of them. So I come in here every once in a while and just look around and remember all the great memories we've had. Probably one of the biggest problems with the world today is families don't spend time together. Learning to we do a lot of things together, and because of that, we have good communication. 
however you may define utopia, as a place of faith or a community of friends and family, as a place where work brings joy, or maybe just a place where the sky is blue and the water runs clear. Lee Bevely seems to have found his utopia, and it's a real place in the Texas Hill Country. This is Anders Pond, and what's cool about this area is that it is a natural tupelo pond. Biologist Lori Lomas is looking for an animal few folks ever get to see. She's scanning the trees of this tupelo swamp for the threatened Raffinesque's big-eared bat. Being that the Raffinesque big-eared bat is a species that depends upon older growth trees, you tend to find them here. This tupelo tree was discovered about four years ago. We put some radio tracking devices on the bats to figure out where they were going in the winter. Turns out this is the tree where we would find them almost all the time. In the winter, these bats will all colonize together in the same roost. However, in the spring, the males go their separate ways where the females all stick together and they form a maternity colony where they'll all have their pups in their summer roosts. One maternity colony has found the perfect summer home in this rather spooky looking structure. This house was abandoned 18 years ago. We were going to tear it down. We decided that we would rather keep it open for the bats and actually keep the house in working order enough so that they can use it as a roost. Oh, there's some right there. One, two, three. You typically find the bats in abandoned houses in the spring to summer months because they're looking for a warm roost. And we have some towers as well that were built specifically for these bats in this maternity colony. And they're close by and the bats will readily move from here to the, the towers depending on the temperature. I can hear them, they're in there. Raffinus big-eared bat has very large ears. As you can tell, they kind of resemble rabbit ears. They're used for echolocation. They're used for navigating in the dark and also for hunting prey, and also for communication with each other as well. With man-made roosts and with further protection of pristine habitats, there is hope that the Raffinesque's big-eared bat may one day be out of the woods. What we know about this bat is that it was in decline. Because these guys need old bottomland hardwood forest, very old forest. We've purchased this refuge. We're continuing to purchase more properties and let the properties get older and older and older. And as the trees mature, that will create more habitat for these guys.
This series is supported in part by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, conserving the wild things and wild places of Texas thanks to members across the state. Additional funding is provided by Toyota. Your local Toyota dealers are proud to support outdoor recreation and conservation in Texas. Toyota, let's go places.